Because if you have toxicity in the brain, so let's say you've got envy in your brain or you stay in a state of argument, you've created a state that is not unlike something like having a virus in your brain or your body. And as soon as there's a virus in your brain or your body, your immune system will respond and recognize the toxic issue, the argument or whatever, in the same way as it would identify a virus in your brain or your body. So it sends out immune factors and inflammation is created. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Freud, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Caroline Leaf. Dr. Leaf is a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist with a master's and PhD in communication pathology, and she specializes in cognitive and metacognitive neuropsychology. Since the early 1980s, she has researched the mind-brain connection, the nature of mental health, and the formation of memory. She was one of the first in her field to study how the brain can change, which we call neuroplasticity, with directed mind input. Dr. Leaf has helped thousands, hundreds of thousands of students and adults learn how to use their mind better and detox and grow their brain for success. Dr. Leaf's podcast is called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, and she's been prominently featured on YouTube and places like Elle Magazine, TED, Huffington Post, The O Magazine, Thrive Global, and many others. Her new book is called, the same title as her podcast, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, and it comes out in a couple weeks. Stay tuned for a fascinating conversation with Dr. Caroline Leaf, teaching you all about how to clean up your mental mess. First of all, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Been a fan, always see you on the charts, see your incredible content on Instagram. And it also just makes me smile to know as somebody who's like so into their family, I work with both my sister and I work with both my dad and I've worked with my older sister in my previous companies that I've had over the years. And it just brings uh, a smile on my face when I see a happy family working together for a positive mission, which is even bigger than just, you know, making money. So I just want to say a hats off to you and your family, because you just shared with me that you work with three of your daughters, which is incredible. Oh, thank you so much, Drew. I, I really appreciate that. I work with my husband as well. He's also part of it. So it's like literally only one child isn't involved. So, but thank you so much for having me on your podcast and sharing that. Yep, if you can work with family, it's, it's great. It really works really well. So yeah. And, and I'm a big fan of yours too. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So I actually have a, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to start off with before we jump into hero Absolutely. journey a little bit and some of your work that's there. One is off of that. You know, I think anybody who has worked with their family on anything, or even if you haven't worked with your family, let's say you're planning a bridal shower or a wedding, or you're supporting yeah. with a birthday party. Anytime you work with people that you're close to, especially family, there's going to be little messes that come up. Are there Absolutely. any top suggestions that you've seen over the years of you working with your family that there are going to be breakdowns? How do you help clean up some of those messes and breakdowns when they happen? I'm so glad you asked that question because it's so relevant. It's, it all sounds rosy and wonderful, but because it's family, you can you can let your guard down, as we know. And so, so we've ta- adopted a philosophy, and we don't always apply it, but it's what we try and use as a guiding principle. And that is that there's one of, a very famous philosopher, and I cannot remember his name. He said there's three things that are important: be kind, be kind, be kind. And th- those are like the the tenets of what how we try and manage working with each other because it's very easy to get snappy or irritable, especially when you're under pressure. So that's one of the things that we really try to apply. The other thing is we don't let the sun go down on any irritation or whatever. So we we deal with it. We try and deal with it on the spot. And I know it sounds really funny, but the system that I've developed for managing mind, we actually apply it. We like tell each other, do a neurocycle, you know, get do, do that, be aware. So, so we train ourselves to actually live in this mode. And honestly, when we do, it really helps. Just recently, I did a, a podcast actually where Dominique, you've met Dominique, who's my producer, and we were on our way to, we, do, we always do Orange Theory together and we do fasted workouts. And so we were on our way to Orange Theory. And I happened to wake up in a bit of a mood worrying about about something this was about a couple of weeks back 
and we get to, we on the way to Orange Theory, she asked me something, but it was the way she said it. So I ended up getting totally irritated. She has this mother who understands mind and all this brain stuff. And here I lost it. I got so irritated. We ended up having this really stupid argument just before we got into Orange Theory. And we got there, we both stormed into Orange Theory, but immediately started applying the principles. For a moment, we forgot them. And then as soon as we got into Orange Theory, we both applied them and First of all, transferring that negative energy into exercise is always a great thing. Did some little breathing exercises and then went through while I was on the treadmill, pounding the treadmill, I was going through the the concepts, the neurocycle that I've developed, just going through the process to work out and what, why, why I was doing that and why did I get there? What can I do about it? Basically managing the situation with my mind and transforming the neural circuitry before got out of control and she was doing the same thing and as soon as we got out of orange theory the first thing we said to each other was i'm so sorry you know that's it really honestly an example we do blow up but we do apply the principles of mind management and it's it's like kind of a rule and that helps so it's powerful the, <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll break down what the neurocycle is and you'll take us through the process and everything absolutely like with right, pleasure. Right, i think the the theme that i'm really getting from that sharing and thank you for opening up i know it's difficult and you've mentioned this in your podcast in the past it's difficult for especially therapists and people who have worked in mental health to open up about themselves. And so yes. I see you sharing stories from your life and I know that can be tough and you're yep. working against sort of trained behavior where you're told not to open up to exactly people there. But I do find that with listeners on this podcast and I know me as a person, it humanizes this experience because even somebody like you who teaches it, when people know that you have to practice it as well, then they're like, okay, I don't have to be perfect, nor should be perfection the goal of things. That life events are going to happen. As long as I have the tools and I continually can dip into those tools, then it's all about just continuing to do the work. I totally agree with you. And, and that is so true. I mean, it's, 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 it's true. my training. I mean, I trained in the eighties and early. And so that's four decades ago, almost. And I've been in the field of mind brain research for this long, 38 years. I've been a clinician and, and I've, I still do research in clinical trials. So all my training has been around that model of the eighties, which is you, the therapist, you keep your distance, you, the clinician, you, you there to just give advice and you, the kind of fix it person. And you kind of should know how to hold your own life together so you can fix everyone else. And they don't say that directly drew, but that is the philosophy and why so many physicians, because I train physicians around the world, thousands, and why they are batting so much. I mean, one physician this day is, com is committing suicide from the stress and the pressure of having to know everything and having to keep this unnatural distance between people. And I know you're about connection and, and friendliness and, and building social connection, social genomics. And the, as some of the research I've done really confirms and backs up your, what you talk about. And honestly, it's, it's vital that we form those deep, meaningful connections with whoever we are with. So the more authentic we are with the patient, to client people I don't see I don't practice anymore but I'm obviously reaching millions with my platform and I find the authenticity is uh, the, and the vulnerability is vital in taking these very complex brain science kind of concepts and not just teaching at people but trying to help people understand okay this is what we're supposed to do and this is how I'm trying to do it and when I do do it this is the impact so that's the approach that I've sort of moved into and I think it's healthier you recorded a podcast earlier this month. I think it was on like January 4th, where it was a very vulnerable podcast where first you were sharing your um, appreciation for the new Disney movie, Soul, which I think you had just watched at that yeah. time. Yes. And uh, we'll come back to that and some of the themes that you kind of really impacted you. But uh, on this topic of, you know, clinicians, and I would say just a lot of people feeling like they cannot talk about their mental mess because of the pressure. It's not often, I think in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, there was a lot more pressure of don't talk about these things. It was more explicit. Yeah. Now people may not be saying that, but people still feel that societal pressure of don't talk about things that are going exactly. on. Exactly. And you opened up in this podcast and you talked about what a challenging basically year it has been in sort of your ecosystem mm -hmm. of some people that were close to you that you had been taking care of who were having, you know, from my understanding, suicidal thoughts or going through periods of thinking about that. How did you, somebody who teaches this and supports so many, what did you have to remind yourself during this period of 
being there, not just for others, but for yourself as well? Well, that was, that was a really tough time, but a extended family member actually tried, they actually took an overdose and it's someone that we are very close to and I was the one who found them. So it was very traumatic as you can imagine. And I was the one who took them to hospital, you know, with my family took them to the hospital as extended family member. But in, in that moment, you are in such a terrifying state of acute trauma that you don't always know how to react. But what had happened was that years of teaching this stuff kicked in. And this is where we you know, talk about the mind and the brain and wiring, using your mind to direct the neuroplasticity of your brain and to, tra to basically transform neural circuitry so that it works for you and not against you and literally wire in um, foundational ways of responding. So in that situation, when we were going into the hospital and I was in a, in a suicide situation, because I'm very familiar with the mental health system, they don't let for anyone, especially extended family members come in. If you're a, a direct family member, maybe, but generally not because they've got to stabilize and there's all the behavioral, the psych stuff and everything. But I just stayed so calm and they could see I was totally upset, but they could see that I knew what I was doing. So I did a neurocycle. I basically got myself together. Even though I was living in a place of total panic, I pulled myself together enough to be able to get into the hospital so it didn't look like I was going to freak the, you know, make a big scene. I was very calm. And once I was in the hospital, I felt myself spiraling out of control into total despair because you're watching I mean, this person was coding and it was terrifying. And I realized that if I didn't stay calm, this person who was very close to me, would it's going to affect them. I mean, there's all the, 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 the connections between humans that we that there's the science behind and so on. So I basically applied the five step, the five step neuro cycle in the, multiple times over the evening. And then it got to the point where once the, the, my, the, my family member member had stabilized, I then had to now fight the mental health system, which is one of, okay, once you go in for a suicide, any attempt, you pretty much can lose control of that extended family member or close family member if you don't know how to advocate for them. So in that, once I had got to the point where the person was stable, I then once again did an intensive neurocycle where, and maybe I at this point can explain what that is. It's Please. basic. It's basically a system of mind management. It's it's how you. It's based on 38 years of studying what happens at each stage in your brain when you go through uh, managing a thought and and what is a thought and what does that actually mean. So, it, it, like in that situation, I'm, my thought, for example, was I now have to protect this family member so they don't get sucked into the psych system, and we don't know what's going to happen, and that's not going to be the ideal for them. So I knew that that was so that was my thought. So, but in with that thought came all the knowledge that I have about what happens in the current psych system. So there was a lot of fear and anxiety um, coming, uh, affecting my ability to think of, you know, in a functional way. So that would have, and I've got some models here, just, I'm going to just jump to a bit of brain science because I know you love the brain. Um, so basically the two parts of my frontal lobe would have been out of, um, out of balance and I would have had a drop of blood flow and oxygen in the front of my brain and I would have had very low alpha activity and very low beta activity and gamma, which means means that I was not going to think with cognitive flexibility. And that's a survival mechanism historically, because we didn't need to think we just needed to run. Exactly. So the, all the energy went to that run. Yeah, totally to fight and flight. So everything was drained to that to basically to the limbic system. And so my mind was well, my logical mind separate from the brain because the brain's a responder. The brain doesn't generate thoughts. The brain responds, but the brain will respond to whatever you have ingrained in it. So the survival mechanism or the previous patterns of trauma, whatever. So long story short, I had to gather awareness. And I say the word specifically gather awareness, which is the first step. Gathering means to bring together a specific chose those words to encapsulate what happens in the brain when you become aware of something. And you don't just become aware, but you transition from awareness of the chaotic and toxic thoughts and whatever's going on in your brain, um, in your mind in, and in your brain, the two together because they work together, and transition from that to actually capturing those toxic thoughts and being empowered to control them and drive them in a direction where you keep your brain functioning at a higher level so that you can have cognitive flexibility and make wise decisions. Because the last thing you, think you want to do in a, in a critical situation is react incorrectly. You want to react and respond with as much wisdom or the things are going to go crazy in whatever right. situation. And if I could jump in, th of thank course. you for that. And let's, uh, a lot of things covered there, so I want to break them all down. Absolutely. And, and, and really I, I can say a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you're a great speaker, so you have a ton to say and, and your background and everything. And so let's expand on a couple of those things. So really, when I first heard about the, the neurocycle process, what I was imagining is it's a way of putting up boundaries around your true intention, because often stories, we all tell, tell ourselves stories, yeah. a story could come in. So the story in that situation of being for a family member, in your case, who had just attempted suicide, which is so tragic. And, you know, my heart goes out to that person and your entire family. Thank you. The story can take over of what if they don't make it? What if what's going to happen if if they're in the system? And I know a lot about the system because my dad used to be the CFO of a group of psychiatric hospitals and so the you good, know. bad and ugly of all of that that's that comes with it. So it's the questions that come up. What if this doesn't work out? And by the way, for anybody who's listening, this isn't just in a situation like this, which is quite you know challenging and extreme. extreme. It could be in anything that people are going through and you have an interview process coming up for a job that's there. What if it doesn't work out? What if they don't like me and I never get any job and then I'm homeless one day? You know, the thoughts start to spiral out of control. And the neurocycle process, I thought of it as like, you setting an intention for what that thought is and you are now creating the you are now creating the space to come back to it because, and, and I'll get to my question here in a second. Uh, it. The most important thing that you shared was awareness. We interview so many people on this podcast who talk about awareness being the first step to, let's say, identify trauma or to start to heal the past. But there's always that question my audience has, which is, but like, how do we actually cultivate do it. awareness? So good. So good that you that you asked that question because there's so much science also showing that with our huge approach in the wellness industry and even pop culture on mindfulness, and I'm not saying it in a derogatory way because we have to be mindful to become aware, but it's seen as a very reduced component. It's been reduced down to sort of a thing. And that's where the problem comes in. Because if you're just mindful, but you don't actually do anything, you'll get worse. And that's what a lot of research is showing and what, and what my research showed as well. So let me distinguish between and, and what, b before you just can I just one question about that? Absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. I want to hear your interpretation of why is that the case? Because so many people hear this word. Is it that we could become mindful of the wrong thing? Is that why you're thinking that you, things could end up getting worse? You can be mindful is the concept of mindfulness is to become, as you know, aware in the moment, non-judgmental and to try and just focus on the now. We can't do that because we temporal distance and we temporal travel all the time. Our mind never stays. Our mind's on two levels, conscious and non-conscious. And, and the non-conscious is sweeping between the past, the present and the future to make sense of the now. So we can never just isolate the now for more than a few seconds. And so what what the, the point of that is that when we try to just stay in the now we're going to miss everything around our context and we're going to land up temp temple traveling anyway and getting confused so that awareness gathering awareness is a bit like gathering apples into a basket instead of sitting under a tree and it all hits you on the head so think of an apple tree just all the apples shaking and they're hitting you on the head that's one kind of awareness that is very destructive but if you actually direct the process where you pick the apples okay i'm feeling anxious i'm feeling depressed i'm feeling frustrated i'm feeling terrified you gather awareness of the emotional warning signal. So each apple you pick and put into your basket, you controlling the process. And this is what the neurocycle is teaching you to do is to control the process instead of it just being a random aware of all these things going chaotically all over the place. You you want to be aware of everything, but you want to embrace it in a way that you don't see it as scary, but you see that as each apple has a message. Each apple is a warning signal. So it's either an emotional warning signal or a physical warning signal, generally two categories to start off with. So, so to answer your question, how do you become aware? What did I do in the hospital? What apples did I gather awareness of? I gathered awareness of my terror, of my um, anxiety, of my, uh, I wasn't depressed. I was highly anxious, highly terrified, highly on edge. So those were three of the apples that I picked. My whole body was tense. My heart felt like I was going to have a heart attack. So what were my physical warning signals? By doing that, I now had a level of control. So Drew, I may just diverse for a moment. In the West, we have a philosophy in um, mental health that when something is toxic, like depression and anxiety, it's seen as a symptom of an illness. And you well know this because you're very versed in this area, a symptom of an illness that needs to be suppressed, like it's bad. And also it's defined as a neurobiological 
correlate or they're trying to find neurobiological correlates that have produced that. I don't believe that's the correct narrative. And if you analyze the science, it's completely back to front because it didn't start in the brain. It started in your experience and that you are having and how you process that experience. And then you used your brain to actually create the experience into transform it into a physical state and also into your body. So if we, if we use this little model, brain and body, the, when, we, when, when I had that experience with my loved one, that was an experience that I transformed through my thinking, feeling, choosing mind into physical physical thought trees in the brain into the DNA of every cell of my body, which is why we experience things in our body and in the gravitational fields of my mind. So we store um, information um, of experiences moment by moment in three areas, which is why when someone experiences, for example, recalling a trauma memory or recalling, even doesn't even have to be extreme trauma, just recalling an argument, recalling that argument with my daughter, for example, versus recalling the trauma of this family member, uh, extended family member suicide attempt, two extreme Extremes. One is very extreme. One is not as obviously as bad an argument, but both, if I recall them and they're unmanaged, both will come back with all the feelings, their sensations, the emotions, the bodily sensations, which is why people with unmanaged trauma, um, when they recall something, the, the it's the whole body that re- responds physically and then this this would represent a toxic thought this would represent a healthy thought because thoughts look like trees trees in the brain so what would come up then is the emotions the information so the emotions the data what happened plus the experience in our body plus the whole uh, the whole conceptual experience the whole narrative the whole context which comes up in our mind so that's why it's so overwhelming so when we gather awareness you want to break your awareness down into a very organized systematic mind management process and cleaning up the mental mess using the neurocycle is a very systematic organized process that we do non-consciously at 400 billion actions per second 24 7 so i've taken a non-conscious process and i've made it a simple conscious process that when you deliberately do that you can systematically learn to manage your mind and tap into the depths of your non-conscious and, and basically use your mind to fix your mind, to, re, to rewire the thoughts, to change the neurophysiology in your brain, to improve your mental and physical health. And it's, it goes through stages. So this first stage of gathering awareness is, as I said, not just allowing things to bash you on the head, but you drive the process. So you literally stand back and observe your own thinking, feeling and choosing, which is what I did in that hospital. I split into two. Here's Caroline in the state of trauma with the loved one here's Caroline who is now going to be almost like a clinician to myself and I'm saying okay what are you feeling what are the emotional warning signals what are the physical warning signals so like a clinical analysis then going into awareness of what are my behaviors what am I saying what am I doing what's my body language what's my tone of voice one of the comments they made in the hospital was that they fought for me to stay with because the medical director wanted everyone out and the nurse one of the nurses head nurses fought for me to stay in with with the patient because they they saw that I was being compliant I wasn't freaking out I was keeping myself together and every time I moved away that person got anxious every time I came back that person was calm again so they saw that so I managed to create um, uh, basically my the, the by gathering awareness and going through the five steps I managed to keep myself in a calm enough state that I could focus and I wasn't a threat does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And I think another way of looking at it is we just had um, Gabor Mate on the podcast, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about the importance of creating space between you and the identification of the exactly. things that are happening. So when I'm hearing you explain about awareness, partly is even just the core principle of I have thoughts, but I am not my thoughts. I have feelings, but I am not my feelings. I'm not all these things, but these things are me. And I have to create a little bit of space between me and them so I can objectively see them rather than spiraling immediately and identifying as, oh, I'm, f- I'm feeling anxious is a very different statement than I am anxious. I am anxious is almost exactly. like a statement to make you more anxious than exactly. I'm sort of feeling anxious a little bit. Okay. I'm not going to, as you say, toxic positivity. I'm not going to pretend yeah, it's no, not no. there. I'm you gonna- actually going to tap into it understand that I'm feeling it, but recognize that there's the feeling and then there's the true me, which is a 
being aware of it all. Exactly. The true me, which I call the depths of the wisdom in your non-conscious mind, we can call it whatever you want, your spiritual level. The, we have that inner core where we know that we need to do this kind of stuff, create that space, create the temple distancing. I call it the multiple perspective advantage where you stand back and observe yourself and you do this throughout the process. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're creating that space so you can direct the process. And in that way, you can then take that thought of I am anxious to I feel anxious because it's shifted completely. So in the West, we don't have that philosophy. In the West, we have the philosophy that those are bad and they need to be dealt with. In the East, the philosophy is, oh, those are helpful. Therefore, they are messengers. So in my recent re clinical trials, which I put in my book, um, The King of Your Mental Mess, in the first part, I actually put a summary of the trials. I actually showed this, that if you look at depression and anxiety and the terror that I was feeling, for example, in that moment, as messengers of an underlying symptom, I can then find the message, the meaning in the message. So then I gather awareness in an embracing way and an organized way where I can start creating that space, standing back and observing my own thinking, getting a multiple perspective. And that way I can become much more analytical and organized and then distinguish between the narrative of the thoughts that are going crazy, the messy ones, between the narrative of the thoughts that are, OK, let's get some some wise logic going here so that we can get some balance and find the true way of functioning. So we've literally got two minds that we we've got multiple, we've got a, non, a conscious mind and a non conscious mind. But in our conscious mind, we operate in two states. And both of those states have veto power where we can override. And the core state, we, we in the neuroscience literature, we talk about it as being wired for love. So there isn't any wiring in the brain for toxicity of any sorts of fear, frustration, anger, etc. That's not natural wiring. That's a distorted wiring. And we see that with proteins folding incorrectly, etc. In the mind, we see that as the optimism bias. And it's all for survival. Because if you have toxicity in the brain. So let's say you've got envy in your brain or you stay in a state of argument. You've created a state that is not unlike something like having a virus in your brain or your body. And as soon as there's a virus in your brain or your body, your immune system will respond and recognize the toxic issue, the argument or whatever, in the same way as it would identify a virus in your brain or your body. So it sends out immune factors and inflammation is created. So I showed in my study that, the, for example, our, our subjects in our experimental group, when they gathered awareness at the beginning of the study through all the psychological and neuroscientific and blood and DNA measures that we did, they became extremely aware of their chaotic and toxic thoughts. The ones in the control group were not given any form of mind management. The ones in the experimental group were given the neurocycle and they used it daily. It was on the app loaded on their phone. And so they had a way of gathering awareness, gathering the apples in the basket, doing this stand back and observe your own thinking, the creating space and not seeing those as threatening, but seeing them as helpful. So we saw saw significant changes, for example, in at the beginning of the study, homocysteine levels, which is, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all the blood measures, but homocysteine and cortisol were significantly high in all the experimental and control group because they all came in with anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, all kinds of stuff, tra trauma, burnout, you name it. By the time we had taken the experimental group through the neurocycle, the homocysteine levels had normalized, which meant the inflammation had normalized, the cortisol levels had normalized, the DHEA levels had normalized, the DNA, telomeres on the DNA, which we can discuss maybe in a moment, those, those had stabilized. So what I'm saying is that the biology was reflecting what was going on in the mind. The mind was influencing the biology. The biology was telling a story from the beginning through the process. So I know this, and I know that if I'm in that state and I don't gather awareness properly, my physiology is going to go down the wrong route, and it's going to create energy patterns in my brain that will not allow me to be functional in that moment or effective, function effective in that moment. So that, that gather, and, and what I always say, Drew, is that before you gather awareness, and we're taking long to explain this because we're kind of analyzing it, but you can do this in, in very quick in five minutes and 15 minutes max, um, but you need to prepare your brain. Your brain and your body need preparation. And that's where all the beautiful techniques of breathing exercises and tapping and, and uh, meditation and havening and whatever you want to do is great and important to do to get yourself in that state and prepare your brain. But most priming. people stop priming. Most people stop there. So the research shows, and I showed this in my control group, that if you are primed and you're also aware, 
but you don't have management, you get worse. So we saw, for example, our um, control group without mind management, not having the ability to get to, to do the five steps, gather awareness and reflect, and, and we'll analyze the other steps in a moment. Their telomeres, for example, shortened. So telomere, as you know, it's a, chromosomes, are, uh, come, the DNA strand, you get the chromosomes, and telomeres can be my pink fingernails, just for argument's sake, to make it super simple. And telomeres are required, they're, they're considered a proxy for how we manage our mind, how we're managing our emotional state, our stress, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of research being done, done on that now. And so I wanted to see, could we actually impact telomeres, which talks about cellular health, aging, cell health, um, physiology, neurophysiology. Could could we impact that in, in what sort of time period? And most of the time they say five years. We saw changes in three weeks, and by nine weeks, we saw significant lengthening of the telomeres and strengthening of the telomeres. What that means is that for those listeners that don't know, I know you understand this, but what that means is that um, some of our people at the beginning of our study were chronologically, let's say, for arguments like 30, but they had bodies um, and their, their biological ages were of a sickly 65-year-old. So they had bodies that their bodies were 35 years older than their actual chronological age, which meant that they had an increased um, susceptibility to illnesses. And that increased by a factor of 75 to 98%. So then, you know, the, when we hear that people are dying eight to 25 years younger from preventable lifestyle diseases, we have to look back at what is one of the main driving forces. And it would come back to mind because mind is the source of all your thoughts. Thoughts are the product of of how you are processing life. And those products produce your behaviors. And those products move of thoughts, move through your brain and body. So they affect your physiology, which is what we saw in the telomeres and the his homocysteine and the cortisol, all those different just measures. Really, just really shows the power of the mind time and time again. And even in this world that we're in, which is functional medicine, integrative medicine, yeah. um, with a lot of the past guests, just how much you've seen a shift in the last few years of the doubling down of like, Yes, food. Yes, exercise. Yes, this. But if most doctors that have been on this podcast had to say like one thing that basically can trump all that is that you could eat as healthy as you want, you can exercise. But if the mind isn't cleaned up, if there's not a state of being of emotional wellness that comes in, you can think yourself sick. And that's exactly what you guys were demonstrating in this study. I want to ask exactly. you a question. Uh, so one distinction that I want to make sure that everybody got, because there was a lot of great information. No, so, sorry. No, don't ever <laughs> I talk apologize. a lot. I got, I got lots of information. <laughs> you know, it's don't ever apologize. And it's great. And it's my job as a host, just as you've been a host of making sure yeah. that listeners um, get it. Get it. Uh, so one thing that I think is a key distinction that you're presenting is much like in, uh, you know, let's say at my place that I'm at right now, if the smoke alarm went off, if you were taught your whole life that smoke alarm means immediately everybody's going to die in a fire, when the yeah. smoke alarm happens, you're going to get hysterical because you're just waiting for impact to happen. Exactly. But if you're taught that a smoke alarm is a good thing because it's telling you, hey, pay attention. And in that same way, you are really saying that first, we have to understand that these things that we demonize as bad feelings of anxiousness, these fears that come up, feelings of depression or depressive stuff that might be there, whether we're diagnosed or not, those things are a signal in the same way that a smoke detector is a signal. And it doesn't mean we freak out. It just means be alert. Something is going on. So we have to appreciate exactly. and thank our That's body. Exactly for actually giving us those signals to, to pay attention. Exactly. But you the, got the, it. That's beautiful. The, the question that I had for you that I'm very curious on, um, that's partly tied into this, but a little separate, is when you are actually going through this process of awareness where you're first creating space and identifying that, you know, here's the you, which is the awareness, and then these are the things, and you're sort of getting the lay of the land of what yeah. you're feeling, of what you're noticing, things that are making you feel this way. I know people are different thinkers. Some people are more auditory. Some people are visual. Do you actually see a mental movie of that space? Like what actually is happening for you in that moment? Or how do you typically think about it? Are you imagining it in your head and you sort of see a cartoon? Is it more of a feeling based thing where you're feeling in your body? Do you say anything to yourself verbally so that you can hear it? I'm curious about your method. 
So you're quite right. One of the things that I've researched over the years is the uniqueness of how we perceive things, so how each of us process. And there's been a lot about the VAK, visual auditory kinesthetic, and you know that's been disproven and the seven types of thinking. And that we, we, that's kind of old science and doesn't even apply. What we what is the, what is the current more accurate science is that we everyone uses everything but completely differently. So we're all going to draw on a bit of the visual and the auditory and the kinesthetic and all the different things, and we're going to package that into our own. So to answer your question, and the way I packaged all of those tended to swing between a very, almost very linguistic, very word-based. So I was having a conversation in my head. It was definitely um, an internal conversation. And I, I, was, so I wasn't I was actually seeing it playing out in my head. So always visualization would always happen. But in my mind, there was a conversation and a very clear, distinct step one, two, three, four, five. You've got to go through these steps. And then I'll, be, I'll go very quickly to writing, um, which, is, which is actually the third step and the fourth step where you, where you and even the fifth step you can bring writing in in different stages so does that answer your question so for me it was very much an internal conversation um, and then a trans what I did see was as I progressed through the five steps more and more visual images will come in so you never eliminate one at the expense of the other there is visualization going on you can't eliminate that you are getting hearing sounds everything is coming into play but the dominant force that was helping me process or that that I was very aware of was was words, a discussion with myself. Now other people may have seen it as a complete movie. So by the time I got to step five, it had transferred into a movie of the two options, this road, this road. There was like a little TV show going on there. So it, it did progress. So we're both doing two things, as you mentioned earlier. We're talking about basically your approach to messes, right? We like yes. when people have a mess, a situation happens, you know, you have this great quote, which I wrote down earlier, is that when your mind is a mess, everything else in your life is a mess, which is why you're so big on, hey, let's clean up this mess. And then one of those techniques to be able to do that, that's based on research is this five-step method that you guys have created, which my understanding is people can both do, and it's also an app as well that, that can kind of like, they can walk through yes. the experience. So since we've been both analyzing it and talking about your framework and discussing these five steps, could you actually walk us through in detail since it only takes five minutes? Do you think that we could walk through the steps together? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to just also, before, before we dive in, just say that I want to thank you for pointing out the fact that we have become so focused on brain, I mean, on your own brain and physical health and, and exercising and eating. It's such a dominant thing in the wellness sphere because it's so easy to manage those. But if we could just give a little bit of attention to our mind, which is the behind the eating and behind the, the process of exercise, for example, just a quick, you're probably aware, but the pancreas secretes 20 different neuropeptides uh, to, which we need to assimilate food. And if you're, you're eating a super healthy farm to table meal, but you're in a toxic state from worry or anxiety or or something's happening that you haven't processed, or that argument that I explained earlier with my daughter if I hadn't processed, if I ate a meal in that state, I would have lost up to 80% of the nutrition because the pancreas wouldn't have been able to secrete all 20 neuropeptides. Case in point, mind is behind eating. Mind is behind exercise. Mind is behind everything. It's the source. So you can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water. You can go three minutes without oxygen, but you don't even go three seconds without using your mind. So my underlying premise of the five steps of the neurocycle, which is a process, is that your mind is working anyway. It's changing your brain anyway, which is directed neuroplasticity. The brain's always changing. So you may as well direct that change because whether you like it or not, it's happening. So my whole thing is self-regulate so that you can actually learn how to, to systematically drive your mind to drive the neuroplasticity of your brain to transform the neural networks and wire out the, the wrong thoughts, the, the narratives we don't need and replace them with a narrative or reconceptualize them into narratives that bring mental peace. And that's what my work has shown we can do. But it's a skill, Drew, that like we learn to eat properly and go to the gym and exercise to become an athlete, it doesn't happen overnight. But somehow we haven't as society applied that same philosophy to mind. We should be teaching mind from in this from young I my patients, I had patients as young as three. We should be teaching our kids from day one and we should be training ourselves in, in mind. Mind is malleable and it's a skill that we develop 
develop. So the neurocycle is a process that you that doesn't replace therapy. It doesn't replace any techniques that are out there. That's the beauty of it. It's not replacing ACT therapy or some kind of psychodynamic therapy. All of those still work. It enhances therapy. The point is that if you are going to therapy, what are you doing with yourself the other six days of the week? And what are you doing with yourself 24-7? Your mind's always working. During the day, your mind is building the, the, the experiences into products which are thoughts. And those thoughts are then driving the next action. At nighttime, you sort out the thoughts that you've been speaking, uh, that you've been building during the day, which is a regenerative process preparing you for the next day, all part of our survival. So if we don't control that process, then that process can get really messy. And that's why I talk about cleaning up the mental mess and being very direct and self-regulated. So having said all of that, the, the neurocycle a stress is so simple. The, the five steps are ones that we're all aware of. What I've done is just work out the systematization of the process to know that when you do this, this happens in the brain. So literally with each of the steps, and, I, and I'll just throw in a little bit of brain stuff each time, but there's a massive amount of neurophysiology across the brain and the body in all systems that is responding at each level in this transition of taking chaotic thoughts and then rewiring the networks of the brain um, and, and which leads to improved mental health and physical health. Also, one thing I want to say just as another baseline is that we've got to stop seeing mental health as an illness like cancer or diabetes because that's not even accurate science. Not even top scientists will agree with that. Even your top people in the field, um, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, um, there's, there's obviously a split, but it's uh, there, there's a lot. If you analyze the research, we'll see it's not an illness, it's a response. And like COVID, now we're all in a pandemic. Obviously, people are depressed and anxious. It doesn't mean that you're mentally ill. It means that you're having a normal response to an adverse circumstance. And, and sometimes it can be a response like, yeah, for the situation that's there. Yeah, exactly. So what we need to do is recognize and embrace that response in order to manage it. Otherwise, it's going to control us. So we need to be empowered to get autonomy and be able to get control over that process so we can look at the, literally look at that toxic thought, see what it's doing to our behaviors and our perspective, find the origin story, which is the roots, and reconceptualize that. And that's pretty much what the five steps are doing. It's teaching you how to embrace, process, and reconceptualize. Okay, so first and, is the brain. And before you break Sorry. it down, just wanted to add one sure. comment to that. I think as, as medicine continues to grow and evolve and really look at the root cause of all illnesses and things, there are even both physical and mental illnesses, right? Even though you're you know, explaining that it's not an illness in the same way, there's more and more research that comes out every year about how most of what we think of as disease, which is usually something is happening mm -hmm. to us. The standard sort of idea in the mental health world that you talked about being bogus, the chemical imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. Or Total. for instance, let's say cancer or heart disease. Well, a functional medicine doctor looks at heart disease very differently than a traditional yeah, doctor. A traditional doctor is saying, this is just happening to you. We don't know mm -hmm. why. We know genetics are there. Yes, smoking plays a part. But another person is looking at it and saying, well, actually, this is an appropriate response. Plaque in the arteries is an appropriate response to systemic inflammation building up. It's not your body's messing up. It's actually doing exactly Protective. what it needs to do. Exactly. And when we look at our entire body and our mental health that way, then we're not demonizing exactly any sort of response that's there. We are exactly. simply looking at it and saying, what is my body trying to teach me, which is a big part of your message. So exactly. I, I love that. Off. No, no, You're it's so good. To go into the breakdown of the process. No, I love it. You, you basically just said it provides context. We've actually got to provide context to the whole situation, not just look at the end product of heart disease, but to look at the context of the whole person and what they're going through from where, what's driving their mind to eat like that, exercise like that, or not eat like that, or what are they doing with their stressors, et cetera, et cetera. So context. And it's so all I, full circle because- Yes. You know, as our ancestors have known, you know, that there's no right diet for the brain or for the heart. It's like what's good for the brain is also good for the heart, is good for exactly. your, your belly, is good for all that. And at the same time, too, if we have negative thoughts and emotions that impacts our likeliness and willingness to want to eat healthy. Exactly. And of course, if we eat a diet that is very high inflammatory, eating the wrong type of oils and other things regularly, then that can also make it more difficult to be in a good mood. We can have more inflammation, which exactly. affects our brain. So Feedback all these loop. things are just tied and we have to understand and look at it in the holistic sense, which is where you're talking about the Eastern, Eastern viewpoint. 
Exactly, bring the east to the west. So eating, if you choose to constantly eat a diet that is toxic, that's a mind choice. You're still, you're still thinking, feeling, and choosing, but you're not controlling that. You're just slipping into patterns that are not necessarily the correct way of thinking, and that's affecting your dietary choices. But if you really think about what am I eating, what is it doing to my body, you've then taken charge of your mind to control your mind about what choices you're making. So you're thinking, feeling, and choosing about the food instead of just responding to TV ads and convenience of processed foods or something, or just ignoring and putting aside, oh, I don't believe chemicals are dangerous or whatever. And so that's, that's a choice of your mind too, but mind is operating in a toxic sense in that way. So I also talk in my book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, about using the five steps to gather awareness of what kind of attitude you have to food and why and how you can change it and build it into a good habit and what that will be sustainable. So it's not, oh, you must eat healthy for your, as you said, for your heart or whatever. You actually need to eat, eat healthy as a person. You need to understand why, what are you doing it for? What is then, and get that knowledge and so on. And then that, that's also, you can use the five steps in exactly that way to build a habit, a good habit, and to make the decision about why you have the bad habit and break down the bad habit. So, so it's many ways. So it's toxic traumas, which is, going to take time to heal um, acute traumas, big T traumas, small T traumas, toxic habits, building new habits, uh, uh, b- b- can, improving connection and communication, improving dietary lifestyle. So it's basically the neurocycle is your system for how you get your mind under control so you do that stuff. And that's what's missing, as you said earlier on, in this current approach that we have. People talk about mind being the hard question of science. It's the most obvious question of science. We're using our mind all the time. If you were dead, your mind wouldn't be working now. We're using our mind just to communicate. The listeners are using their mind to, to listen and respond. So, so having said all of that, we've got to get our mind under control. We've got to self-regulate. And that's what the five steps of the neurocycle are. That's how I call them neurocycle you keep cycling through them so it's not a one-off thing that you do it once and that's it you fixed definitely not there's a time frame involved in the five steps to to be able to change behavior so you can use it in the moment to keep get control which is what i was doing in in the hospital or in that argument but then there's going to be using the five steps daily for around 15 to 45 minutes to deal with maybe a traumatic event like maybe a trauma in childhood maybe you were raped or abused or bullied or something as a school child and now that's just You've never dealt with that. It's become a toxic issue and a trauma or with war trauma or grief or whatever. You've going to, it's, it's not going to go away overnight. It doesn't go away in three weeks either. In three, it takes around about three weeks to embrace process and reconceptualize the thoughts through the five steps daily. And at day 21, you're going to be changing, you're going to change from I am depressed at day one to day 21, I am depressed because of, and I still feel depression, but now I know what to do about it. And I know why, where the depression comes from. So I know how to reconceptualize. To day 63, it's actually impacting my behavior change. I'm not as depressed as often. And when I am depressed, I'm getting it under control much more quickly. So I'm embracing it. So there's a complete transition and shift, but that takes nine weeks. And we always talk about three weeks for change, 21 days, which is a complete myth. It's not even science. So that's why part of the neurocycle is understanding, you know, what length of time do I need to use it for? What is the time frame involved in actually creating behavior change that you don't just one think about doing it, but you actually do it. For sure. And I know there's a lot of different theories on that. Of course, there was the 21 day theory. We've had BJ Fogg come on and talk about his sort of habit approach where, you know, he's sort of an advocate for like changes can happen more immediately. But I think the consistent themes are number one, there is, there is the anchoring in the neuro pathways when things are done repeatedly and to be gentle and to actually be committed to practicing something. So it becomes (laughs) a part of us, which is why you are such a big advocate of the process. And I love, you know, earlier, and I've heard you in previous podcasts call it, you know, it's work, right? It's like actual work. Yeah. And I often thought about when I heard that quote, like, you know, Byron Katie has her process and she says, I call it the work because when you stop doing it, it stops working. And I immediately thought about that when you talked about, so good. you have to do these things. And just like, training at the gym all the time or being good at like making quick and healthy meals, the more you do it, the more you train it into your subconscious. So it starts to become more automatic. You might find yourself, I know this has been the case for me. You might find yourself at a place where, okay, you know, six months or something happens, you've been practicing it. And then you enter into a situation which previously might 
immediately trigger you. And what is triggering yeah, like yeah. identifying with that thing instead of realizing there's that thing and there's you and there's space in between. Exactly. And you're just not as reactive. And you're like, wow, this is now kind of a, the part of who I am. I'm a whole Exactly. Person. That's the reconceptualization concept, which the Japanese explain it uh, that b- beautifully with the Kintsugi principle. I'm sure you're familiar with the Kintsugi principle. Have you ever heard mm-hmm. of it? Mm-hmm. So when yep. a vase, for those that don't know about it, when a vase shatters into a thousand pieces or whatever, they don't sweep it away. They actually collect every piece and meticulously rebuild the vase with gold lacquer or platinum or both. So you now have this beautiful new vase and it's beautiful because it's got all the veins, which are the story. So it's reconceptualized. So you remember the past, but it's reconceptualized conceptualized into the new. So you're changing how your past plays out into your future with that concept. And that's the end product of mind management. That's what will happen with your, you're not going to forget your, your, your trauma or the war history or the death of a loved one, grief. That's part of your story. But it either is going to cripple you and you're going to stay stuck in rumination and depression and just not move forward and do what only you can do and contribute to life. Or you can take that and shape it so that and, and wire it to a point where, as you said so beautifully just in a moment ago, that you, you oh, how I'm not falling into that pattern as often before. And it does take that time. And you're quite right. Your brain changes all the time. Back in the 80s, we were trained that the brain couldn't change. And my and my professors, and that dates me, like it goes back, goes back four generations. And we were trained to teach our patients to compensate. So I worked with traumatic brain injuries where there was literally no research because they said, why bother? Their brains are damaged. You can't do anything. So, okay, give me some brain damage, seriously brain damaged people, and let's see what happens. And by using the neurocycle in its infancy, now it's much more advanced. We I, I literally took people that were vegetables through to getting degrees and getting having IQs higher than prior. And it wasn't me. It was them getting hold of the system and applying it into their life. Hard work, months of work, years of work, continue. it's a lifestyle. I'm not teaching a once-off magic trick. If you're looking for a quick fix with mind, it'll never happen. Mind, cha- mind is working and changing every moment of every day. Your brain is subsequently changing every moment of every day. So the guy you mentioned the, who talked about habits, I can't remember his name, who said that our brain's always changing. Okay, and you can get change immediately is correct, but is it sustainable? You're, it goes to, and this is what I've tracked with my, neuro, my neuroscientific research, what's actually happening at like day four, day seven, day, day one, four, seven, 21, 14, 21. There's, there's, there's key points where you get major shifts and you only get certain things like gamma peaks occurring at day 21, which is showing that we've actually got insight. We've tapped in, we get an increase in what we call alpha, and I'm sure you've heard of the alpha frequency at the front of the brain, as well as an increase in delta, which is showing that there is an insight developing that is enabling me to look at what I have experienced and see it as a lesson and see possibilities, you know, and to actually then be empowered to face that and see challenges as opportunities, not barriers. I mean, barriers as um, barriers as challenges and, and opportunities. So, you know, it's that, that's the shift in the transition we're talking about. So I'm not saying, oh, it's all going to be wonderful and put on roads, fire steps in your life's ma- no at not at all i'm talking about very real stuff life is messy if you're human your life's generally most for a large part of the time you're going to experience messy moments day to day big stuff small stuff over your life what i'm teaching us to do is to embrace that process and see it as part of our humanity and learn how to manage it so that we can operate in a functional way and contribute to the world in the way that only we can which is anyway that's a little bit of philosophy there we diverted from the five steps but i think it's being a great important foundation so no as you were saying earlier just it's important to have context of the what and the why before you get into the how otherwise because sometimes you can see something so simple and say oh how how could that possibly work it's too simple because we want a more elaborate a more different solution we want to do backflips <laughs> to achieve the results exactly. instead of realizing it could be actually that simple if we understand the why behind it and the what behind it, which is what the podcast has been about so far. So let's actually jump in through the process now is perfect opportunity to get into the how. Okay. Let's take a classic example of a, a relationship where you, let's say you're on different pages with a, a partner, okay. a loved one, a husband and wife, they feel strongly about one thing and you feel strongly about another and there's a disagreement. Okay, so there's the, so I'm, I'm going to use this toxic tree as representing the disagreement. And the, the reason I use trees, there's a healthy one and there's a toxic one, is because can you see them? Is it clear? Can yep. you can yep. you see and them? For those that okay, are is that you know you can watch it on YouTube, but I think you'll be able to follow along on the audio. 
So think about a tree in a forest, and that's what the thoughts look like in your brain. The the dendrites on the neurons form these tree-like, arbor-like structures, and it's from the most recent research, it appears that our memories are stored in the little dendrite parts, which is the branches, and they've got, um, there's a root portion and, and, and a sort of branch portion, exactly like a tree. So as experience happens, so, so the seed is sown, little roots grow, and immediately the tree trunk grows, which is a perspective, and then the little branches grow with the emotions and the behaviors, which then manifest in what we say and what we do. So here a relationship starts and let's say that it's the beginning of the relationship and a minor thing happens and it's not such a big issue because you're still in love and whatever. And then a few months, normally around six months into a marriage, that's when people aren't as tolerant anymore when that sort of honeymoon phase is over. So what could have been just a minor thing at the beginning of the relationship may now be starting to transform into something toxic that's starting to irritate the couple. I'm just giving a, a random example. So sure. let's say it's something about, it could be something as simple as um, uh, what, maybe one person is very pro um, vaccines. Let's take something very current and one other one the other partners is anti or something. And then it comes to the whole philosophy of around that sort of thinking and whatever. And that might have been interesting at the beginning of the marriage where you have differing philosophies on major issues, but now it's become a major issue where it's grown because there's been multiple arguments. Every Whatever you think about the most is growing more branches, more roots, each experience, each discussion. So this thing gets stronger and stronger over time. So now you're in a situation with uh, the loved one and a topic comes up that that immediately pulls this thought up, the topic activates or triggers this thought to come from the non-conscious mind and the non-conscious mind operates 24 seven, always on, conscious mind's only on when we're awake and the non-conscious is where all our trillions of thoughts, um, are thoughts with their memories, because like a tree has branches, thoughts have memories. Where, so where all our thoughts with their memories are stored, our belief, which contain our belief systems, our value systems, our upbringing, every experience we've ever had. So it's massive. So here we have this discussion and it leads to an argument and immediately it triggers up this thought which has lots of memories of that argument in 1965 and that one in 1981 and that one about that and that one last year and so it's a thought tree about this disagreement of basic philosophies and multiple arguments and which led to multiple some, some emotions have to do with that person and some which maybe have nothing to do with that person exactly it could have just been an experience related to something else so there's a little branch here look at this one sticking out it's coming from another thought that's similar from a baby with another person but it's kind of all into this mindset that you have. So you're kind of looking at this person through this this thought that's moved into your conscious mind. So that's the perspective that you are viewing them through. And or and, and it could be that that person is has tried to change. Maybe that person tends to, that you're arguing with, tends to say things like, you always, or which we should never say you, we should always say, I feel that instead of you are like this. But they tended to do that a lot. And so that comes up and gets added to this. And so suddenly now we've got you looking at that person through the eyes of the arguments of the past, connected to maybe other people's arguments, connected to how you've had arguments in the past. It brings up another toxic thought about the way that we've had arguments where you didn't listen to me and you never and you always, I mean, we should never use always and never in, in an argument because they're such strong adjectives and will just create an aggressive response. So that's now happening. So that's the situation. So what do you do? How do you do a five step? Um, in fact, I did a podcast on this yesterday, this very thing. You first look at the warning signals and what, what are the warning signals? You look at two types, physical and emotional. And the warning signals are like the odor coming off this thing. It's the fumes coming off this, this situation. So it might be frustration, total irritation, fuming, mad, whatever. And so whatever each person's emotional signals, then their body language and what are you feeling in your body? Tension in your shoulders, adrenaline rushes, eyes may be, um, di you know, pupils dilating, whatever it may be, blood rushing to the cheeks. So you you stand back, create that space, go into what I call the multiple perspective advantage. You describe that as the space and you stand back and you observe this, these signals. Then what you do is as you've observed those signals, you're aware of this whole thing happening because it happens fast. The, the anger, these warning signals, it all happens very fast. So you just want to be aware. You just tell yourself literally, what are the emotional what are the physical? So that very cognitive clinical element creates that space. Then and what when you're you do, doing that, do you actually, do you, do you speak that either? Yes. Out loud. Preferably said out loud. Yes, and I would do it, I would recommend, so when, when I did couples counseling and that kind of thing, or work with in trauma with families and that kind of thing, I would teach them to do it, to talk out loud, teach them both a system. And in the argument, both talk out loud. Okay, we're both freaking out. 
what are your emotional and physical warning signals? So you're immediately creating that distance and that space. You then can go into some sort of breathing. And one of the breathing techniques that is really powerful in calming you down is the 10 second pause, which is breathe in for three and out for seven. The extended breath out, the extended exhalation increases blood flow and oxygen to the front of the brain. You're literally pushing it to the front of the brain. So you do that yoga whoosh where you push it out and that increases um, decision-making capability. Now, if you do three in, seven out, and you do that 10 second pause six to nine times, you'll calm down the neurochemical chaos in your brain. So now this is a bit of priming. So I've become aware, but I'm now quickly slipping into some brain priming to get me into a calmer state. So before you carry on talking, you say, okay, listen, guys, we're both freaking out. These are my body's feeling this, my emotions are this, your emotions are this. So let's just breathe. Let's just do this 10 second pause. And then you add a cognitive component as you do the breathing. And this is a lot of other exercises, but this is quick and it's powerful, especially in a relational issue. So as you breathe in, you say, think, feel. So in your mind, you're breathing in, two, three, but you're saying, think, feel. And then as you breathe out, you say, choose. So it's think, feel, choose. And you can do that out loud or in your mind, but adding the cognitive component of think, feel, choose, those three words, which is mind. Mind is how you think, when you think, you feel, when you think and feel, you choose. That cognitive component creates more space, more distance, Brings, it stabilizes energy levels in the brain, blood flow, all kinds of amazing things. And then it helps you to then refocus back on okay, the emotional and physical warning signals and the gathering of the apples. Now I can shift into a little bit more depth of my gathering. I'm going to go now to my behaviors. So what am I saying? What am I doing? What is my facial expression? What's my nonverbal communication? What's your facial expression, your nonverbal communication? What are you saying? What are you doing? Are you leaning forward like this? Are you shooting eye set statements? and accurate, whatever. So then you look at your behaviors. So you both analyze. At this stage, the clinical analytical stage has distanced you a little bit from the argument content, which gives you perspective. Then you and, reflect. And can Sorry. I ask one question just to jump in there for context? Because yes. I'll just make sure that I'm following along. In the example where it was you and your daughter on your way to fitness class, and yes. you kind of got into a little bit of a tussle, naturally there are moments where you just, an argument kind of, pops and one person says, and that sort of thing, even people like yourself who have invented these things and had that. So in that instance, asking for myself in the audience, are you telling your daughter, look, let's pause, let's go through this together. Or is she talking and you're kind of doing it on your own and then you're bringing her into it? So sometimes we'll both, like in any situation, sometimes we'll immediately stop and we'll be able to, to, immediately do what I'm describing Together. in that. But yes, in that. Yes. And we both, even if we're doing it silently in our head and we sort of started like we'll prompt each other, emotional warning signals, my husband and I said, what do you do? Five step emotional warning signals. And we kind of prompt each other and we'll get silent for a while. And we kind of pull ourselves back. But there's sometimes where the argument does get heated and there's a period before we get into this. So then there's neurochemical chaos. And that's what happened that day in the car. I woke up in a bad mood. I woke up very anxious about stuff and it put me, made me very edgy. So I was not, I did not use the five steps immediately, but I used them very soon after. So I had the explosion. I got irritated. Our, um, our fitness place is like three minutes from our house. So in that three to five minutes, I didn't apply anything. I can be totally honest, but I realized very soon what this was doing to me because I'm so aware of tuning into my warning signals that and so so is my daughter who happens to be my producer and we work together so we're so aware of it that we brought ourselves back quickly and there is the key um uh, uh, there's the, the key drew because I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying that you're never going to argue. But what I am saying is you'll catch yourself in three minutes. I caught myself and so did my daughter in three minutes. We didn't try and solve it immediately. We went into Orange Theory. We did our workout. But if we weren't going to Orange Theory, we would have done something physical. Like we would have maybe just separated for a moment. I would have gone for a little two-minute walk or done some push-ups on the floor. Something physical to just transfer that energy. So I know how to prime my brain, do the breathing, do something physical. Within a minute or two, I can bring myself back that's what I've learned. You learn to improve your mind management of the situation. And then when you go through that process, the quality of relationships change. You're still going to have the arguments. You're still going to have the irritations. But the speed of correction and self-regulation is phenomenal, which then deepens the relationship and moves you forward into productivity and creative intelligence, which is what you need to survive in business, life, et cetera, in relationships. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yep. That makes sense. I think it's useful for people to have context of yeah. asking the other person to 
hey, look, we're both riled up. Let's pause for a second. Let's do it together, which you're saying that's an option. Yes. Other instances where, you know, you don't feel like forgiving that person or them forgiving you and they are having a natural response to maybe something where one party or another party messed up. It could be, let's take a break, you know, do our things to, you know, separately, right? That's It's yeah. okay to take yeah. a break. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then maybe one person might go ahead and do it and then come back for the repair opportunity. Exactly, because in in the messiness of relationships, we can repair and grow. So we mustn't be scared of messiness in relationships. This whole thing of toxic perfectionism, toxic positivity, um, this which is very big, unfortunately, is damaging. It's okay to have an argument. And it's okay to, to, because in that mess, I learned something of what not to do. And it took my relationship with my daughter to another level. And like that, it's just, it's transformed. Every little tiff will take you to another level with my husband, my whatever. So um, that's what I'm seeing. But I'm not scared of the mess. Since I used to be very scared of an argument or very scared of messiness happening. And life happens. I mean, things go wrong all the time. I don't have to tell anyone that we all know that but it's it doesn't scare me as much i i get yes you get terrified but the ter- terror of a suicide attempt or the terror of a something going on financially or whatever um that is it's there still but somehow the ability to get control over it is there it's stronger it's developed it's a skill that i've developed and i'm still developing so i want to encourage the listeners it's not this is not a quick fix this is a lifestyle i'm talking about a lifestyle and the reason why it's so vital is that we saw prior to covid we already had a major problem and i don't think people have i spoke about it in my book but the the decades long trend of people living longer um, which has been going on for years because of advances in medicine and technology has reversed. But between 2014 and 2015, people are not, people are not living long anymore. The trend is actually reversed. And so people are dying between eight to 25 years younger from preventable, preventable lifestyle diseases. And we have to track that back to what we're doing with our mind, which is then influencing all the other aspects of lifestyle. And so that's why I brought that up. There's a whole section on that in the book. And that's what this is also helping us to be aware. If, if people are dying from preventable lifestyle diseases and lifestyles managed by your mind, we need to get our mind under control to to manage our lifestyles, to be able to learn to apply all this great food information out there with all these great wellness experts. But if I'm not going to get my mind right, I can't even benefit from all the great podcast people that you and I both interview that are telling us all these incredible things about fasting and about exercise. And I'm just going to hear it. Mind first, because then the mind comes first so that I can get that under control in order to be able to process. So that's where the five steps is used for that as well, to get your right. mind right, to be able to actually learn from the experts to change your life and improve it. I think that's a fantastic so, sort of overview of, of, of the reason that we want to practice it. And because I know my listeners are going to bring it up. I think we got to step number three. Yeah. Step still, number two. Step we didn't even two. get, we I know you and I, keep, you and I keep diversifying, but it's very good because the quality of each step is being enhanced by our exactly. discussions. So we're, it's we're excellent. Clarifying exactly what it is so that people can see that visual and they can imagine themselves actually going through the process. Exactly. Right. So they've gathered awareness of the physical and emotional warning signals of the behaviors and the other thing they gather awareness of is the perspective. What's your perspective towards this person that you argue? with is it like they irritate me they like my relationship with them sucks i don't really want to work this out or i do want to work this out i actually do love them and i'm just whatever what's your perspective so once you've gathered awareness of those four areas then you can start your reflect process reflect is such a beautiful word like gather awareness is a beautiful word too two beautiful words they're so big and round and contextualized and deep reflect is as well it's basically asking answering and discussing why have i got these emotional signals, these physical signals. Why do I feel this? Why are my behaviors like this? Why, why is my perspective this? So, And then if you answer, well, my perspective is like this because they always do this. Why? 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 And as you go through the ask, answer, and discuss, almost in that same multiple perspective advantage, which is the stand back and observe yourself as though you the, you and you, two of you, one the wise mind, one the messy mind, um, the space concept that we spoke about earlier on. As you reflect through that process, you start digging deep into the reasons why you're in the argument in the first place. And then it's very important to capture what you're reflecting in the third step, which is to write. And there's so much about writing. What I have created in, in, in the right step is a concept called the metacog, which is a way of writing that reflects a lot of the sort of arbor-like structure in the brain. So the neurophysiology. Um, and you, what you want to do in write in the first stage of write, because you write 
from now on, but in different ways. The first stage of writing, step three, is you want to pour your brain on paper. Literally, just vomit out everything that's coming out. Just put it all down. No literary piece of work. Just put it down. And I found that the quickest way to bring depth, uh, to get the two sides of the brain working in coherence so that you can dig deep into the non-conscious and really, you know, really pull on that integrative, um, integrate the memories of the mind in a very wise way. So you get good introspection um, and keep you in that space where you can find answers. The metacog where you start in the middle of the page and you do branches. There's a whole section in, in the book showing you how to do it. And there's a video on the app as well that shows you how to do it. Even if you don't do it perfectly, it, I, it was, I cannot tell you how effective that is in terms of getting to the core issue quickly. The point and is this not still to... still fits within the five minutes of you kind of going through this process. So exactly. So a few thoughts that you're writing yeah. down. Yeah. Even a few thoughts. So let's say that we're doing this quickly. You can gather your warning signals um, of those four levels, physical, emotional, behavior, perspective. You can do that in a few seconds, 20, 30 seconds. You can, um, so you can be aware of those things. You can spend, so let's say a minute on gathering awareness if you're doing the quick version. Then you can spend about a, a minute, a, a, say a minute and a half on reflecting. And then around about two, maybe three minutes on writing. And then you would go to the next step, which is recheck. Also a very beautiful, big, word that's profound and deep and all encompassing recheck is let me go back and look at what i've written and try and make sense of it you know what am, what am i really saying where are the patterns the triggers the activators what's what could i see here that i could reconceptualize so it's not x plus y equals z it's actually x plus y equals xy so it's a whole new creative thing that we're creating so x plus y equals xy means i'm doing the kintsugi principle i'm bringing the past into the present and i'm changing how it's going to play out into the future so I'm not just replacing it and making, I'm actually reconceptualizing and redesigning and incorporating, but making it work differently. And the recheck is how you do that. It involves tremendous amount of integration in the brain. So we see when people are doing the recheck, there's a lot of high gamma activity, a lot of learning, a lot of integrative, a lot of creative thinking, a lot of theta energy flowing through the brain, which is a healing wave. A lot of alpha, alpha wave increases in a balanced way, helping you to dig deep pulls up a lot of deltas. You get this in the wave, you get all these, think of the waves in the sea, you get a lot of very nice waveforms happening in a very balanced way as you progressively move through those steps very systematically. And then and you so get- is the re, is the recheck step number four? Is that- Step that, number four, step, step number step four. Number four. four. Yes. So you still, you, you, so you're sorting out what you've written by looking, you're doing a mental autopsy. So you re, you reread what you've written and you make sense of it. So I always recommend using another color and you go in and you say, oh, that's a pattern, that's a trigger. Wow, I didn't see this. And that's what happened to me that night when I was in the hospital with my loved one who was um, the, the suicide attempt. Um, I, when I started writing and doing the recheck, I didn't realize how I had actually, at the recheck was when I realized I was trying to fix that person. You can't fix anyone. And at and, the core was my feeling of helplessness. And, and in that example, are you doing the process that is written at the hospital? Are you doing it the yes. next day? No, I did it at the hospital. I was sitting there. Um, the, my loved one was asleep and being monitored, all the heart monitors and the beeping. And I was sitting there and I had my computer with me. It was, I, I don't, it, my husband had bought it for me halfway through the evening sort of thing. So I had it there and I just started typing. I, sometimes I do it on my phone. I've got an app on my phone that I type into. If I've got a journal, a like notebook, I'll write into a notebook. So I was doing it there. I was going through those steps systematically. I do it. I live by this. I mean, that, so, it, so it seems like a big part of this is also things that you can do in the moment that sort of yeah. get your body better set up for those arguments, those chaotic moments, like the hospital example, where you are trying to figure out your place in the world and how you're going to respond. And there also seems that this process, which is in what I'm getting that it would be a lot easier to do when you have a little bit of space for yourself, right? So that you're not in the actual moment, whether you're doing it with a loved one or on your own. It also seems like this is a way to change the meaning of how this event sort of sits in the body for longer term. Yes. So you exactly. don't have that reaction in the future. 
Exactly. So you've been proactive and pre- preemptive and you can control the post the post trauma that can happen. So the secondary trauma that will happen, but you 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 kind of a step ahead of it. So yes, totally. Um, when you've got space, you can work in the moment. So you'll in the book I explain when you're dealing with things like trauma, acute trauma, secondary trauma, that kind of thing, um, breaking down a toxic habit. That there you're going to spend around fifteen to forty five minutes on the five steps. So then you've got a bit more leeway. You've got anything from three to 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 sort of seven eight three to seven minutes more or less. 10 minutes if you want on each of the steps. You know, if you take 10 minutes on each of the steps, you won't take 10 on the first. You, you'll, you'll find that you'll take more time on the third, fourth, and fifth step. That's where that those those three accumulate most of the time. But you can use 15 to 45. Now, notice I say 245. I don't recommend when you're dealing with toxic issues, um, anything of any nature, whether it's relational trauma, a bad habit, that you stick with it for longer than 45 minutes. Because of the amount of toxic energy you're dealing with, you want to get a closure and then work on it the next day. And that's why you do the five steps for 15 to 45 minutes in your own time and space daily for 21 days. And then at, from day 22 to 63, you only do step five. So it only takes you about seven seconds a day. But those 42 days of doing just step five, which we'll talk about in a moment, that gives the new thought that you have built sufficient energy to bring behavior change. Like you gave the example earlier on that you realize, oh, I used to do this, but now I'm not doing it anymore. That only happens with time building energy everything's about energy these proteins are vibrating my words are vibrations quantum vibrations in little protein branches in your brain and by now you've you and the listeners have built somewhere around probably 2,000 if not more probably 4,000 and so essentially that protein vibration as it's as it's vibrating it's it's creating a an energy force and that's it's it's real this isn't this is Classical and quantum physics, not something something weird. But that energy, if after 21 days, it's not strong enough to impact your behavior. But after 42 days of just consciously practicing for about a, a minute or so a day, the new way of thinking, and it's a prompt. Like in my in my app, it's a, it's you can put it in the reminder function on the app or on your iPhone that it just pops up on your computer. I am not shame, which is very common for someone who is sexually traumatized. They have to work through that they not shame and. And just to see that for 42 days popping up, it reminds you, it gives the sufficient energy that eventually you actually start believing that you aren't shame. So someone I work with a lot of people with sexual trauma, and that's a major, major problem. They are the victims, yet they feel that they are shame. And that's, so that's a major thing to, to normally work on first with someone with sexual trauma. If you don't add that extra 42 days on, you're going to sort of know you worked on it, but you're still going to be stuck. So it gets you unstuck. It gets you progressively moving forward. So it's a very key part of this process that we, that's where the work also comes in, that you've actually got to do that. Now, just to also answer your other question, yes, you can also do it in the moment, like I did with my daughter in a few seconds in um, at Orange Theory. So by the time I got on the on the treadmill, there was a level of calmness. And in the first couple of minutes being on the treadmill, I had calmed down and we called each other's eye and smiled because we both knew we were doing it at the same time. So you, at that point, I, did, I couldn't write on my treadmill. So what did I do? I visualized. So for step three, I went into an absolute visual of what happened I looked at myself back in the car. So our, our mind can time travel. We, we spend three quarters of the day time traveling in our mind, which means we go from the past to the present to the future. So on the treadmill in step three, what I did was visualize myself in the car and I looked at my body movements, my tone, my body language, how I said it. So that was my kind of writing. And then I could recheck that by rechecking my visual. So by the time I got to step five, which we haven't discussed, the act of reach, it's an act of reaching to, to get mental peace, to anchor you back in a state of mental peace till you work on it the next time. So my the quick version in the argument state, my, my active reach would have been, I'm going to say sorry to catch your eye, smile and say sorry afterwards because I can't talk in the middle unless I can pass it from treadmill to row or something like that. Um, and so that an active reach is something that you do. It's either an action or it's a little statement that you can re- read to yourself and it pops up like a reminder on your phone, like I am not shame or don't say if only today or um, it's okay to feel this or whatever. So it's, a, it's a prompt. Um, and it's like a full stop in a sentence, like the sentence is ended with the full stop. You end that process and then you start it again the next day or you pick it up. So if that argument with my daughter, for example, was a consistently that we argued about this, we keep having the same arguments about the same thing, which we didn't. This was just a one-off thing. But if 
we have had arguments about the same thing. And then we realize, okay, that's actually a pattern. Now we need to go and do 21 day and the 42 days. We need to do the full 63 days. So the short things very often give you eyes into the long things that are patterns in your life. And that's why I love people to use it in the short term, in the five seconds, the five minutes, the 30 seconds, because if you, it trains you to observe how you're thinking, what your mind is doing, what's keeping you stuck? What are the repeated things in your life that you are actually ruminating on that are, you know, maybe you constantly talk people pleasing or trying the toxic positivity or reacting to toxic words. And it's the same thing all the time. And that's very, very frustrating. We, as humans, we don't really like repeating patterns that are toxic because it makes us feel awful, but we don't know. We don't even see that we're doing it. This five step, the quick one, and the long one together teach you how to be much more aware of those things that are keeping you stuck. So you use the in the moment with the other, with the other. And then there's That's one more epic. Powerful. It That's is powerful. Idea. No, there's one more application that is phenomenal. And I shouldn't say this at the end. I should say it at the beginning, but it always ends up like this in an interview and in a discussion. It's brain building. When my patients came in for 25 years, I practiced clinically. And the first thing I would do would be before we dealt with the trauma or the learning issue or whatever it was that we, that I was working with him on, I would do brain building. Brain building is using the five steps to learn new information. Your brain absolutely thrives, as you and I both know, on new information. Brain health comes from new information that we learn, a lot of other things. But one of the quickest ways to build resilience, that you're stronger and that, that brain health then sends that generates that through your DNA, right down to the, you've got 37 to 100 trillion cells in your brain and body collectively. When you brain build, when you do all of this stuff, but when you brain build, you you immediately change your resilience factor in your brain. And you can do that in, in, in as short as 30 minutes to an hour. So I would start every session with my patients, especially the first few sessions, I would start with at least 30 minutes of brain building. And then we would do 30 minutes of say trauma, whatever trauma work we were working on, learning work or whatever. Then I'd get to the point where we would shorten that, but I'd make them do it at home. What I recommend to every person, you clean your teeth every day, you should brain build every day. If you don't clean your teeth every day, eventually your teeth are going to be pro problematic. If you don't brain build every day, you won't clean your brain. It's kind of like a housekeeping function. When you wake up in the morning, neurogenesis occurs, which is has occurred, which means you've got all these new baby nerve cells. And as we think deeply, we very intelligent humans. Humans are very intelligent. We're designed for deep intellectual thought. So when we go through, when we harness deep intellectual thought into an organized systematic process, we will draw on those new baby nerve cells and we will grow lattices into the brain of these healthy green trees that form a very strong foundation for generating very healthy energy through the brain. So when the stuff comes, the acute traumas that blindside us, we can bounce back. We're going to not fall down. And we're going to cry, but we're going to get up quicker and we're going to keep moving forward. We don't lose hope. Brain building teaches you hope and starts building that hope in you, which gives you the energy to fight through the depression and the grief, et cetera, et cetera. So you can use the same five steps. I do brain building and for an hour to two hours every single day. I start my day with brain building and I have my routine in the book. And brain building is one of the first things I do. Even if I do 15 minutes, yeah. I do brain research every morning and then I find time during the day to do it. Totally. That's I've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of information there, but thank you for walking us through it. And as you mentioned, you know, definitely we're going to have the links to the book and everything in the show notes so people can pick it up and actually walk through the process. I did have a couple of the questions, so I didn't want to go through it. the brain building process completely, just so we can conclude and tie in. So Absolutely. I want to zoom, zoom out from NeuroCycle and I want to look at sort of, um, as you had mentioned, life can be messy and a lot of that mess that you talk about in your podcast can even start off with, you know, our parents are well-intentioned and the, you know, most parents are going to be well-intentioned and kids are raised in an environment where maybe there aren't the best communication habits. Maybe there aren't the best priorities that are there. Again, parents doing their best, kids doing their best to adapt. And out of that adaptness and trying to work through traumas, behavior mechanisms can come and we can develop addictions. We can develop exactly. you know, challenges that are there. You've been very open, um, in your own podcast about some of the things that you worked through uh, as a young adult. One of them, I believe, was an eating disorder that, that you had worked through for, for years. And uh, you've also shared some other things that your husband was working through early on in your marriage. When you look to your example specifically, what do you think were sort of key impacts on you as a child or a young adult that were the 
opposite of what we're talking about here, where you can kind of clearly look at things and make meaning of life's events and situations. So you're not internalizing an addiction or a behavior that's there, but, but you can actually see it for what it was. So what do you think were part of what contributed to some of the challenges that you've been open that you've been working through? Okay, so I was had an eating disorder that was around my first year at university. So it would have been around 18, 18. I went to university at 17 and a half, my first degree. And I developed an eating disorder in that first, in that time period. And if I look back at the, once I, once I knew, I didn't know about the neurocycle at that point, and I didn't know quite why I was doing it, but it, and it, it, it is, it, eating disorder is like an addiction, but any addiction is, is there because of some underlying issue. And once I understood, and it was uh, in about five years into my, because I've done four different degrees, and it was about um, in my PhD that I started developing the concept of the neurocycle. It used to be called something else in, in those days, that I actually suddenly clicked because I got over my eating disorder, but it never really went away. So I didn't have anorexia anymore. I didn't have that that level of, of eating where I was like not hardly eating that was I had normalized but I still had the mindset and it took me probably all the way through into the first couple of years of my marriage for me to actually realize I've been married 34 years so the first so we're going back sort of 32 years ago but it, it was almost six years before I really fully understood why and and I would love anyone who's going through an eating disorder to be able to not have to wait six years and that's why I and my eldest daughter had bulimia my um, one of my other kids has battled with anorexia and it's always it's always got an underlying cause now first of all there's an epigenetic factor in that they they knew about mine and whatever's in whatever experience you have if it's undealt with it can pass through the sperm and the over I was still battling with an eating mindset when I I conceived my first two daughters who've both battled with eating. So there was definitely an epigenetic factor. So I influenced, definitely played a role in their battle. And when they were getting through it and doing the neurocycle to get through it, those were one of the things that I had to sit with them and, 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 and say sorry and confess my part in the whole process and how it affected them and the foundation. Then it helped me, you know, when once I was doing that, it helped me then find out where mine came from. Um, and and I, so when I say six years, when I started recognizing that my elder sister had an eating disorder. Both of my elder sisters had an eating disorder. And then that tracked back in our family. So the epigenetic was coming through from at least four generations, which is interesting. Then also I had a grandmother and a mother that were always criticizing my big sister who had a weight issue and always saying, look at her, she needs to lose weight. So that as a youngest child, I saw that happening. I know the intentions were good, but I didn't understand that at my young age of whatever it was. But I saw her five, seven years older than me. So the foundation there was laid that, oh, gosh, you're not going to be accepted by your very British mother, very British, very almost cold. Um, my mom's very really loving, but also still very kind of cold, that British sort of, this is how we behave and it's, you know, you don't do this kind of thing. And that. And I saw her criticizing and I saw my grandmother criticizing my one sister. And it took years for me to actually see that that was one of the seeds that had sown plus the epigenetic. So once I did that, I'm now able to, if I don't, I don't have an issue with it anymore, I've truly been able to, for years now, I've been able to, over, to, deal, to deal with this. Every now and then it'll pop its head up and it'll be a warning signal. And I'll go through, okay, there's my warning signals and I can catch it very quickly and I and because I know the root cause but yes the imprinting of our parents huge in my healing and reconceptualization reconceptualization was forgiveness it was but I had to recognize first I had to have the discussions with my mom and my sister I had to have the discussions with my kids so that they could forgive you know so that forgiveness not in a mushy way but in a way that you can disconnect from the source in a way that you can make meaning and understand that this hasn't just come from you know you it's it's I needed acceptance I need, I, I turned to perfection I wanted to perfect my body, whatever I had to, to be accepted as the fourth youngest, as the fourth child in a very strict home and a mother criticizing two elderly sisters who were who had weight issues. Well, I'm not going to be accepted if I'm not perfect. And so came the drive for perfectionism, you know, and so that led to my husband was an alcoholic. And by the 11th year of our marriage, it took 11 years for him to become an alcoholic, but it came from abandonment issues as a, as a child, whereas a four year, five, five year old, he was put into a boarding school and never saw, so he didn't see his mom for a year and the first day at school he got into an argument with um, some boys 
because it was South Africa and he was he couldn't speak Afrikaans, which is the main language there. And he was they were all calling him name. They circled him, these big boys, and he was this little five year old. And they were teasing him and throwing stones at him. So he picked up the biggest stone that he could and he went and beat up the biggest one. Survival. If I show I'm, you know, I go for the biggest one and I beat them up, this little kid, I can get power back. And so began then that night in the bath, the matron beat him with a with a with a, a metal a brush until he was bleeding and that trauma he suppressed and that trauma then led to a whole bunch of other things and experiences in life but it was a very cool one and led to kind of behavioral patterns that landed up with him drinking too much and um, it became a thing in our marriage and at 11 years into our marriage with four kids I actually said I'm not doing this anymore either we you're going to choose me and the kids or drink and he stopped overnight once he's found the source of his addiction we worked literally for 12 hours we sat talking and working through and started seeing the source. It took years to get all the roots, not years, it took sure. months, but we worked through. So, so there's some real authenticity about how we've applied yeah. it in our own life. And we keep doing it. I mean, it's like every time we have an argument, we on we revert. My, my one daughter the other day, she said to me, she was having some, it looked like a, there was something going on. It was like a major issue with some friends and stuff and things going on. And it was just very overwhelming. And she texted me, mom, I just did two neurocycles to calm down. You know, and when your kids do it, then you know you've won. If your kids are your biggest critics, so when your own children are using the system, then you know that you have hidden something. And I mean, I just see thousands of people set free. That's, that's why I'm so passionate. Sorry. So true. And I, I wanted to touch on that because I want to also give context for the listeners of where all this comes from, right? And yes. that you've had to use it over the years in different iterations as any person that's putting together uh, a framework, you know, it gets, it gets refined and it gets, it gets a name and it gets a process, but it comes from two important things in, in just what you shared. First, just want to acknowledge you for just sharing that, you know, you have talked about it before, but obviously with the new book and chatting about it more, every time you talk about the past or other things, you're putting out a little bit of vulnerability and people get to know your story. And that comes with both you feeling the feelings, but it also comes with people getting a chance to step into your world and see, you know, how did you come to be the person that you are? So it's very brave and it's a very beautiful thing. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. And along with that, so many of what our patterns are as adults, we, we, when you start to trace these things back, as you talk about inside of your book, you can't help but to eventually get to childhood because you can see that yeah. so many of the root issues that are there or root sort of challenges, the friction yeah. comes from just a kid, just genuinely trying to make sense of the world. Wow. Your exactly. mom is giving love to people who are thin or are not overweight. I want love. I'm a kid. Let me do whatever it takes to get that love. And then that gets extrapolated out towards all of our other relationships. Exactly. You no, know, nobody wakes up one day and says, oh yeah, I think I'll have an eating disorder. There's always got to be some sort of underlining. It's a manifestation. Yeah. It's a pure manifestation, manifestation that's mm -hmm. there. And the beauty of the neurocycle process, the brain building, the different frameworks that you present in the book is that even if somebody hasn't had that, we all have our own addictions. It could be working too much. It mm -hmm. could be the addiction to, I'm using quotes with this because it's a yeah. lighter addiction and that's not to make light of alcoholism or other mm -hmm. things like eating disorders, but the addiction to self-criticism. Exactly. Very good. Taught because we were around parents who constantly criticize themselves yeah. and want to be like the person that we look up to. And so we've adopted that. So we all have our own addictions that are there. Mm -hmm. And when we understand where they come from, both in the moment and historically by detangling them and going back to the big beginning part of our interview, creating space, yes. creating that space through this process that you mentioned. Now, all of a sudden we're creating a new story for ourselves. We're not exactly. beholden to this thing that we feel is a story that was placed. Exactly. We've, we've got empowered to get, we've been empowered to get control, you know, and, and you've explained that so beautifully. And, and you know, as a, I practice as a clinician, as you know, and as a scientist, but I've experienced it as a mom and as a human, as a woman, as a wife. And that's what I've tried to bring to the table. And it's true. You, you, you go through all these processes, you go through all these things to try and bring a real, thing to the table, if that makes sense. 
And you can, and that's why I'm so passionate about it because I've seen it work in so many different avenues. And that's why I did the science behind it. So people have got the science to hang on to. I even put some nice, beautiful QEGs in color in the book so people can actually see the changes in the brain from a depressed into, you know, someone who's getting control of their, of their mind. It's fantastic. And that passion enthusiasm exudes in your, in your podcast, in, in your Instagram and, uh, and it's really fantastic, you know, what you're bringing to the world. I want to take a moment because thank you. We, we covered a lot of territory here. You can get the book. People can get the book from our audience. And I know our audience is big uh, readers. And we're always talking about the Wonderful. importance of picking up a book, feeding your brain, building your brain. So you can find the link to that in the show notes. I know you guys also have on uh, the website, you're doing some fun bonuses. So, so when this pod, for the folks who are listening today, the book comes out officially on March 2nd, but if they pre-order now, you have some really interesting bonuses for them. I would love you to just chat about that for a second. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got, they'll get a free downloadable workbook to be able to work through the book. Um, I'm going to be doing, which they'll use in the book club. So there's a three week book club, which I'll be actually teaching how to neurocycle and there'll be the downloadable workbook. There's a chapter for kids, how to apply neurocycle for kids. You get a free month on the neurocycle app, which is currently called the switch app, but it's being updated and um, we're going to be launched at the same time called the neurocycle app. Um, there's, there's, as I said, the book club, uh, extra bonus chapters. There's um, access to some bio-optimizers, cognibiotics, brain, brain supplements that are organic. I mean, there's just like, there's so many. There's so many. I think I've covered all of them. So if they go to cleaningupyourmentalmess.com and pre-order there, then they didn't register. They can get access to all those pre-orders. And then we also have a free seminar on the, um, on the 27th of February, uh, which is in time because your podcast is coming out and people can register for free. And it's a 90 minute workshop where I'll be interacting with the audience, answering questions and teaching how to neurocycle. In the book club, the three week book club will kind of follow in that same format after once the book is launched. But the 27th of February, um, we can send you that link as well. And that's free. All beautiful. And we'll make sure we have the links to all them in the show notes. Dr. Lee, thank you. thank you for being part of the podcast and joining us and sharing your story and just being so open with everything that you've gone through that has shaped you into the human being you are now so that you can help people, even if they haven't gone through the same thing that you have, you know, they can still benefit. And, and that's the beauty is that's the hero's journey is you've gone through it. And the hope is to pass on the information so that people don't have to go through that exact same thing. Exactly. That you went through. Life is messy and it always will be, but we can learn from the people that have come before us. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for the great interaction and questions and discussion. I've really loved it. Fantastic. Thank you again. Thank you. 